Jeremy Kipley. Hello and welcome. Is this, is this working okay? Yes. Maybe a little higher. Beautiful. Great. So this morning, a lot of the emphasis and the focus was uh, looking broadly at how we balance these elements of power, diplomacy, development, and security, and how we leverage that into creating, facilitating uh, democratic institutions. And then we looked precisely at some of the very most afflicted states that are in violence. What we want to do here in this panel is open the aperture a little, look a little further down the road, and look at those states, those places in the world that are now transitioning from fragility towards prosperity. And so what can we do in those instances? What are the, the top level ideas and the, the best strategies to increasing the institutions in those areas? And to, to borrow a phrase from uh, President Servile of Liberia, how do we sustain the gains in those parts of the world? Uh, to help me do that today, I'm going to introduce my panel uh, all the way to my left. Uh, we have Mark Schneider, and Mark is the Vice President at the International Crisis Group. Um, right here sitting next to me is Sarah Cliff. Sarah is the Special Advisor and Assistant Secretary General, Civilian Capacities at the United Nations. Did I get that one right? I believe in the program it's actually not correct. It says uh, that you're at the World Bank with that same title. Which you used to be. Which you used to be. Okay. So, but no longer. So. Excellent. OK, I'm glad we, we cleared that up. Um, and uh, Nancy Lindbergh is the, here at USAID as the Assistant Administrator for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Affairs. And then finally, uh, I think our farthest panelist out there has the distinction of coming the farthest from the conference. Uh, from uh, Timor Leste, we have Amelia Perez, who is the Finance Minister. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, Amelia, I, I think um, the, the prize for having spent all that time in the airplane is we'll let you go first, since you've had the most time to think about these issues on, on the way sure. over. Uh, I think uh, as we're looking through the framework of the New Deal and this idea of a New Deal, uh, there's been a lot of conversations uh, from, uh, from thought leaders and from a lot of institutional thinking about the New Deal. Uh, what I'm curious about is, have we have we pursued at all a strategy of not talking to all the right people, but talking to all the wrong people, all the voices that we don't often hear? Uh, there's a lot of high-powered degrees and, and, and thoughts in this room, but um, sometimes uh, I find that my, my best political conversations come from cab drivers. And my, my, my last two cab drivers, uh, both in Liberia and in Afghanistan, both talk to me about the, the Land Rover problem, is that they see what their idea, their perception of development are people in walled compounds and Land Rovers. Uh, what's new about the New Deal that's going to change that perception? OK. Um... Actually, my, the most senior advisor that I have in Timor Leste is my gardener. So I share the same thing with you. Uh, the New Deal, the, the, the good thing about the New Deal is that um, the partners are actually talking to us, the leaders of uh, fragile states. So for the first time in history, uh, we have a voice, and it's a collective voice because uh, to come up with the New Deal, it came out from this international dialogue between the partners and, and the leaders of fragile states that came together and we formed a group called ourselves the Little G7 Plus. Started with seven of us, and then as we moved on, others found out that they shared the same kind of challenge and problems and wanted to be in the group, and that's why we call ourselves the Little G7 Plus. And when we shared our problems, and it was interesting because I was here this morning and I was listening to the, uh, the speakers of the first panel, including the second panel, and I thought, wow, uh, they were describing what we were talking about. The New Deal is about five peace building and state building goals as the goals the goals, that, the goals to, to kind of monitor or, or measure uh, before we get to a stage where we can actually start working towards the Millennium Development Goals. What is the problem uh, with the, uh, I, I guess, the aid industry is that most of our development partners' programs are designed uh, uh, within the framework of achieving the MDGs. And it is a fact that not one single fragile state is going to achieve MDG by 2015. 
And then when we looked at it, it's because there is a gap. And for you to, what is MDG is about? At the end of the day, it's about getting people out of poverty. Uh, but to do that, you first of all need to have peace, as the other speakers have said uh, many times. You have to have peace but, and, and to uh, deliver services to reduce poverty, you need to have states. And therefore, you need, how do you measure that? How do you measure that you are actually building the states in those institutions? How do you measure that you have peace? There's no goals, internationally acceptable. And so we came up with the PSGs, five of them. Legitimate politics, security, access to justice, economic foundations, which is creation of jobs for people, and how to manage your resources so that you can deliver the services. Because most of the fragile states, you'll find that all of them are rich in natural resources. So they need to have systems in place to manage those resources. Then how do you deliver uh, uh, this work? The, how do you implement the New Deal? We came up with two principles so that people do not forget about it. We call it focus and trust. What is focus, is a focus about? The F stands for fragility spectrum. What we say is that you should not come into my country and then assess me how fragile I am. I should be assessing it myself so that we can sit together and design those programs to address those uh, the, the, the problems that I have found out through the assessment. Otherwise, if you assess me, which I think until today, until, well, very often, until even now, every agency does their own. The World Bank does it, the, 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 the United Nations does it. Uh, every other agency has its own way of assessing how fragile a country is. But the people that are in the country are not part of it. Then how do we know? Why do programs fail in our countries? Because we don't know uh, that the program is supposed to address this, this thing that you've assessed that I know nothing about. Therefore, how can I work towards achieving? Now, that's F. Then there's the O, focus. O, which is you're supposed to have just one plan, one vision. Everybody should be working towards that rather than everybody having a, uh, their own little plan and then creating more tension and more problems in the country, which happens very often. And then, of course, as you go and want to implement it, you have like a compact. That's what C is for. Uh, you, you, you identify the priorities of the priorities, and then we expect our development partners to kind of finance those priorities rather than finance everything else that is not a priority of the country. Then we make it into a compact so that we work. And then it's focused. So U is to use the PSG to monitor whether you are achieving or not. And the S is to support political dialogue, because how do you get there? By talking to each other, not only between us and the development partners, but between us and the civil society, between us and other people within our own uh, communities in, in country. So that's focus. Then you've got trust. It's in interesting, you know, the, the words focus and trust. Trust, the T stands for transparency, both ways. We need to know how much money you are saying that you are giving to us, pledging, and you need to know what are we going to do with that money. So we have to be transparent. And, and R, you are engaging in fragile states. You need to take risks and share those risks. Most of the development partners are very uh, risk averse uh, because always they come back and they go, oh, what do we say to our taxpayers? Well. The problem is that if you don't take risk, then nothing happens out there, and then what do you get? In your country, it? What's, what's an example of a risk that, that you've had to deal with, that, that you would encourage your country to take a greater risk where the partners, the donor nations, weren't well, necessarily willing? starting by using our country systems. They, they don't even do that. The develop, most of the donors will not use that because they think it's too risky, because our systems are not... Uh, good enough, and you heard a uh, president from Liberia today, you need to use the country system so that you can help us strengthen those same institutions that you came to help. Otherwise, you go out and you leave, yes. what do you leave behind? Yes. Nan Nancy, let me ask you from a USAID lens, um, when you talk about aligning the relationship between, or realigning possibly the relation, 
the relationship between the donor nation and the, and the donor country. Uh, what, how did you, when you, in conceiving the New Deal, how, how does that fit, harmonize that relationship in ways that it had in, in the past? And are there bright spots that you can point to uh, that would be emblematic of that? Um, yes, and you know the, the conversation, as you pointed out today, has, I think, really teed up a lot of the key issues that undermine or that underlie um, the New Deal. And Busan was such an important landmark in terms of re-envisioning what it will take to get to the MDGs, that if you don't address governance, if you don't address the causes of fragility, as we heard all morning, you will not be able to, to find your way to a sustainable um, development pathway. Uh, what, what I find very um, encouraging and interesting and, <coughs> and it, in and of itself a bright spot of the New Deal is that it, it creates a normative framework that is promoted by the countries themselves, and it creates um, a, a, a way to have accountability so that if we are, as a, as a development partner, um, providing investments through a country system, and to quote the finance minister of Liberia, uh, Minister Kone, who said, use our pipes. If they leak, we'll fix them. And it's the will fix them that is really important, because if you don't um, have that accountability built in, and the fixing doesn't happen, and if you don't have the leadership in place, it is very difficult to continue on that pathway. What we see, I think, as a potential bright spot coming out of the G7 Plus is the way in which it's almost a support group that helps hold themselves accountable, um, and that enables the development partners um, to engage in a different way. There is um, a lot of sources of fragility um, and a lot of things that uh, whether it's conflict or natural disaster that keep a country knocked off its feet. But if you don't have that commitment to improving governance, and if you don't have the leadership that moves the whole exercise forward with accountability, then you really do have um, a, different, a, a different exercise. We've um, uh, committed with Sweden to work with Liberia as one of the pilot countries. And I think that both Timor-Leste and Liberia have the possibility of really proving the theory of the case, that by focusing on a few strategic investments during this critical um, transition time, this new pathway can take us forward. Uh, Sarah, I want to turn to you. You've done, you've done such a tremendous body of work um, on the sort of empirical data nature of some of these issues. And I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if you could assimilate all of that into, into one idea that would be beneficial for the donor nations to take away from, and then one really important principle for the donor countries to take away from. Based on all of your research, where do you lie? What are the fundamentals here? So one for the, the governments exactly. and societies and one for donor countries. So for governments and societies, very much as Emilia laid out, I think it's crucial to recognize that these are political processes of change. And you need to mobilize people around one clear plan that can help get you that sort of political uh, support. So from the work that we did in the, the World Development Report, what that would tend to indicate is that countries who've moved through transitions have identified two or three key results in the sort of areas that Emilia talked about in the peace and state building goals, and then have delivered on those results so that they build confidence with their own citizens and they can start to go on to the next stage of change. So much more a, a process of mobilizing an inclusive coalition of change through the sort of political dialogue that Emilia talked about than a technical process of reforming institutions. And from the donor side, if I was in a different audience, I would say as the very first point, invest in the areas of the PSGs, invest in political processes, security, justice, jobs, etc. Now, actually, USAID has been very strong in general in investing in these areas. So, I would focus on one perhaps additional point to add on to that, which is to be very careful to be supporting goals that make sense domestically in these societies, 
going beyond what can sometimes be a pressure for narrower national interests of donors concerned. So what do I mean by that? Well, to take an example, if you take support to the security and justice sectors of countries, looking beyond what can be national interests in spillovers from drugs or counter-terrorism activities, and looking at what will help the leadership of the country really build a compact with their own people, which means delivering on national issues like crime reduction, protection for civilians, reduction of violence in areas is crucial. That, I think, can also be supported by using more South-South exchanges, because very often that's a good way to get some information in on the options for building that sort of process. It can be helped by measuring progress against the sort of areas that the peace, uh, peace building and state building goals cover, something, again, I think USAID has started to do a lot more of, but we know in the past some of the tools like the MCC did not recognize uh, progress in those goals. And last, the, the point of using the pipes and then working to fix things if they're leaky, I think is a very good point. Using the pipes without making that noise, of course, doesn't really work. It has to be a compact where there's a commitment on both sides to help build national systems, but also to fix things if things are shown to go wrong. I, I think one of the uh, principles of the, the New Deal is, is diversity of voices. And for gender diversity up here, Mark and I. Uh, I Mark, uh, from, from your vantage point, and you've seen societies come both in and out of the continuum, uh, the continuum of conflict, the spectrum of conflict. Um, what, what, are the, what are the successes here? What are, what's the biggest opportunity, uh, but also what's the biggest challenge in bringing the New Deal into reality in terms of actually making a difference? It's interesting. I think to some degree over the past 15 years, the crisis group has been working on these issues. Um, and uh, to some degree, I've seen some of those uh, countries uh, up close. And I think that the greatest opportunity is that we know a great deal now about what the conditions were that brought the conflict about in the first case. And so when you look at the World Development Report, you look at the Carnegie um, Commission on Preventing Violence, you look at the Brahimi Report, uh, clearly we have a better sense today about what those factors are. And so we're able then to try and devise policies and to work with partners in dealing with them. The biggest challenge is actually doing it. In other words, are we beginning to change the way that we operate as development agencies, the way that diplomats engage, uh, the way that uh, the civil society and the media uh, participate, recognizing the drivers of conflict, whether it's the, the ones that Paul Collier identified in terms of greed, et cetera, or grievance. And I, there, there it seems to me it, it's fundamental to recognize that you have to deal with the political processes and get at the original causes of conflict more effectively. And I would just emphasize that one of the things that we now know, and we've known for some time, is that a fundamental area is the area of the rule of law and justice. And the fact is, is that in, with fragile states, we haven't done a very good job of helping them strengthen those institutions in an effective way. Um, and in post-conflict situations, the international community still, in our view, is, is not prepared to offer an integrated assistance with respect to the rule of law. And that goes from police, judiciary, citizen awareness of their rights, and functioning uh, rule of law systems. And we need to do a much better job. Uh, and that also deals with, to some degree, the, with the issue of corruption. Um, and I think that one of the things that's quite important about the New Deal is that there is a compact on the part of the, the countries to carry out these reforms. If they do, will the donors make good on their own commitment to maintain over time a significant level of assistance despite the economic problems that we see within the developed world now? And will they continue to provide the support for the key areas that the countries have defined that are essential to deal with the original causes of conflict? Excellent. 
Uh, in, in the spirit of democratic institutions, they, uh, the, the Crowd Hall, the folks from Crowd Hall, which is a service that uh, people have been polling from the Twitter sphere and the internet, have been asking questions. And so one of the questions that has uh, risen to trending popularity, uh, and which I will pose to the group, is uh, how, what is the role of the, the private sector, and, and how specifically do the, they influence the successful transition from fragility to prosperity? So I'll leave that up to the group to answer the, the tweeters of the audience. Uh, I'll take a first stab. And I, I was just in Yemen and um, met with some private business leaders who said 20 years ago, um, we, Yemen had a very vibrant um, business climate. Um, many, many representatives of a lot of different international corporations, they all left. And it, it, it illustrates two things. One is the tenacity of the the, Yemen, the Yemeni business uh, people who have really stuck with it and created jobs. And two is how important it is that you tackle that jobs, justice, security trio that you know, I think Sarah's research really highlighted for us in the World Development Report, that they are interlinked. And we heard this throughout this morning's panel, that you need to help employ people so they have confidence um, and that you need the enabling, and government, uh, enabling environment through better governance to enable the private sector to come in. If you rely on the government to do all of the economic growth, you probably won't get there with the timeliness that you need as you move through a transition. Um, so it, it's critical. Um, again, going back to Busan, it was notable that it was the first time that the private sector was included in the Busan dialogue, I think, in recognition that it's the government, it's the civil society, and it's the private sector working together that needs to create that, that long-term accountability and stability and economic growth. And Amelia, how, how do you get the same number of private, private equity shops opening up in Monrovia or in your country as there are in Lagos? We, we recognize that the private sector has a role uh, but the, or the experience in Timor-Leste was that people did come in, but there, there were no conditions over there at the beginning. There were no basic infrastructure, no electricity, no water. The roads were awful. And the private sector used to give my prime minister the card and says, when you get these things back, then call, uh, call us again. And, and uh, human capacity, because you may have uh, uh, human resources there, but they're not qualified, they do not have the skills, and the private sector needs a minimum of that. So really, it falls on the public sector, the beginning of the transition, to put things in place. It's easy to put the legal framework. You get a consultant in, you draft it, pass it, and that's it. But the rest is not so easy. And I think it's also a matter of time uh, because, like, what is this, the time for this transition? I don't actually even have an answer to that. I know in Timor-Leste we're, doing as, we're trying to transit as fast as we can because we just want to move on to the development. Everybody's just uh, ready to say goodbye conflict and welcome development. That's our motto. Uh, but there has, to, uh, I think the World Bank, Sarah may say, it takes about 20 years or so just to transition from conflict to post-conflict. And, and, and this is talking about, I mean, it's probably not even including the mind setting, changing the mind setting. Mm. Uh, and so a lot of things has to be done by the public sector at the beginning, because private sector uh, is, is afraid to come in, uh, in at the beginning. But for example, with us in Timor-Leste, we also have oil and gas. So it's outside, it's offshore. So they can go in there and then that's an easy one because my country is also a member of the EITI, and so by being part of that, these uh, um, systems, it gives confidence to the private sector, uh, and also gives confidence to us in the sense that no big business is going to come in and corrupt some of us because it works both ways. You know, sometimes business corruption works. You know, it takes two to tango, and often they forget that. Um, so that's what we're doing in Timor-Leste. Mark, could we, I, we had I, discussed yeah. this a little bit backstage, right. especially. Could you comment also on the yeah. mental condition? Because we had talked about entire right. societies. I, I mean, I think that there, the private sector obviously is a fundamental part of successful reconstruction uh, in any post-conflict situation. But it's also 
one potentially a, a negative force. So the issue is, how do you get the private sector in a partnership with the positive elements of, of public policy in order to ensure that they do simple things like pay their taxes, that they don't oppose the government acquiring the revenues it needs in order to deal with the problems of development? Uh, in Central America, we're now, what, about uh, 15 years after the peace agreements. And in virtually every country, the private sector has opposed tax reform. And that means that it's much more difficult to put into place the kinds of uh, programs that are necessary to meet some of the, uh, the challenges. And at the same time, the private sector is going to be the source of jobs. And in an ideal world, they're going to be, th th those jobs are going to be available to bring some of the young people who don't have much opportunity uh, to, to find ways to bring them into a, a positive and, uh, and successful uh, effort at reconstruction. Can I just Please. add something on this, on uh, the need, I think, to support some experimentation in this area, too? Because we have to be honest that the area of job creation is not one in which we have a policy consensus worldwide among economists. That's not true for the US or European econ uh, economies at the moment, for instance. We don't know absolutely what is the right link between policy measures and investment measures and job creation. So it would be the wrong thing to do to pretend that we have an absolute policy answer for how to deal with this area in conflict-affected or, or fragile countries. We have a sense, I think, of some areas of policy and investment that have worked in some country situations. But carrying on to encourage a bit of creativity and experimentation here, including sometimes some public-private partnerships which can deal with the risk issues Emilia pointed to, is important because this is not an area where we have the answers already and the only question is how to apply them. And, and, and I think there are two really key points that, that I would underscore there. And the first is, and we heard it this morning, the importance of managing expectations as you go through a transition and how you calibrate your activities in a way that, given that you can't do everything at once, how do you still engage the youth in the kind of activities that give them hope and a stake in the future? And so that's where I think the whole jobs issue becomes absolutely critical, um, and, and why the, the research that shows that that's a priority is something that very much um, drives us, um, AID, um, as, we go, as we go forward. And, and how, do you, how do you balance the problem of managing expectations, but at the same time asking donor nations to contribute? How do you, how do you justify, how do you continue to ask and, and prove results to, to the donors? Aren't those two in tension with each other? Um, you know, I think what's important, if you look at both um, some key trends that are converging right now, both the New Deal that's, that the G7 Plus has really put on the table, and also the resilience agenda that has emerged from a, 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 a really horrific drought in the Horn of Africa after years of repeated humanitarian assessment, is that we've realized that we have to do business differently. And it falls into a couple of key categories. The first is supporting country-owned plans, because if you don't have a partner, if you don't have that commitment to do the internal policy change and internal investments, to correct what are often issues of marginalization, <coughs> then you probably won't be able to move forward. The second is coming up with frameworks that can, it's the one plan, that can enable donors to work more co cohesively together. Um, and the third is um, finding ways to connect our relief and development activities um, with greater connectivity so that all of the resources that go into the early stage of a crisis can build and connect up to the goals and the longer term opportunities so that you're building resilience even as you save lives, that you're creating that iterative sense of progress in the early stages of a recovery or a transition. I, I would like to uh, offer Tim Leste as a, as a demonstrated uh, example already because um, in 1999 to 2007, uh, we, we, uh, well, there was a report written that said there were like $8 billion that went into Timor-Leste. 
But then in 2006, just the uh, end of 2006 to 2007, there was a big crisis and put us on the uh, verge of becoming a failed state. And that's when we came into government, a new government came in. And so we worked by not adhering to, to the norms that it used to be. Uh, in fact, uh, recently when we did an evaluation of what did we do, how did we do it, it was interesting that a lot of things was more aligned to the goals of the New Deal than the other ways of working. And the point is that after five years, Timor-Leste now has been looked at as a, as a model, as an example for others to follow, as a success story. So, so the things that are in the New Deal works. And uh, at the beginning, I remember clearly because I, I donor coordination is under my portfolio in Timor-Leste, I think the donors were traumatized at the beginning because they did so many things and then it ended up in a, in crisis, so obviously people get shocked. <coughs> Nobody expected that. And then I used to say to them, okay, do this, do it this way. And it, it wasn't, no, they wouldn't do it. But after a year, when I started to demonstrate that things were working, then they came around and started to take a few chances, started to trust again. And, and then we moved on. And now everybody seems to be happy because whatever you invest has a result out there. But by doing a lot of things that now we are, uh, we've included in the, in the New Deal. Trust issue is very important. Having the right people in government, in, uh, good leadership is also important. Uh, but I, this is what I was trying to convince. Um, I just came from Nairobi, where we had our steering committee preparing for the next international dialogue and working on indicators, etc. I was saying that um, when you, when you find somebody in the government and, and the champion, back that champion up. And I think today, those, uh, the, the, the lady from, the president from Malawi, she was saying very similar things. Like when they need to do something, donors really needs to kind of support that person or one or two people, support it, let it go through the whole thing, and then when they start showing results, others will follow. Because everybody, really, everybody wants to be successful. And, and then by doing that, you minimize the room for the bad guys uh, and the spoilers. It happened in my country. We also had people that didn't want to see us successful. And they tried very hard to bring us down. Uh, but we really worked hard. And there's a bit of a difference in Timor-Leste is that we also had our own resources. So we were able to get those resources very quickly and disperse it. Uh, and this is where I try to remind my development partners. When, when you're dealing with fragile state, you, you need to act and act fast. Because some of the processes and procedures in place, they do not help fragile states to get out of fragility at all. It, it exacerbates the situation. What, what are the important metrics that we should be considering when states are transitioning? How do we define a state transitioning out of fragility? So the most important things for sure are measuring the institutional strength has actually got to a level where the risk of recurrence is less. And that means the strength of political institutions, security institutions, justice institutions, institutions that manage the economy. Emilia had mentioned some of the research that shows that this takes a generation. And that, I think, is very important when we think about managing expectations, because on some of those areas of change, absolutely no country has transformed their police force or their courts in a one-year or a three-year period. Even if we look back at the history of this country, you would find lots of areas in which there were big problems with local police forces or courts, and it took much longer than that to actually resolve those problems. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that we can't see some results that move quicker. So Emilia mentioned some of them. In Timor, for instance, in that early period, a very large number of people returned to their homes who had been displaced successfully and peacefully. Another measure that actually moves quite quickly is uh, direct measurements of security, which, oddly enough, we don't actually measure internationally in any systematic way. So it is possible to see a decrease in the number of people 
who were dying a, a violent death in a reasonably short period with a combination of security and other strategies. And yet that's something we don't measure systematically. The last metric that I would measure is trust in institutions. So if, if you want to get a judge of the climate of confidence in a country, one of the easiest ways of doing that is actually to ask people, how do they feel about their courts, their police force, their parliament, et cetera. And that, again, can shift quickly, more quickly than the technical indicators. It's not perfect across countries. So if you ask that question to Swedes and Cubans, for instance, Cubans are almost always happier than Swedes. So across countries, it doesn't work so well. Uh, but if you're measuring in the same country over time, how do people trust their institutions? It does give a good way of measuring that. Or, or it could be confidence because services are being restored. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of ways in which that state-society relationship can and should be repaired in the early stages of a transition, that those surveys are critical for measuring. And I, I, I just understand that's, that's such an important tool. You know, part of that is also is ensuring that the different groups in society feel a sense of inclusion in the process that's underway. And that leads to the possibility of their having trust in those institutions. And as, as Amelia said, any time that there, certain groups are allowed to stay outside the process, they almost inevitably become spoilers. Mark, you were speaking of Central America earlier, and so this past year I was in uh, both Tegucigalpa and San Salvador doing documentaries on, on the drug violence. And uh, one of the things that happened to me when I was there is I wanted to go into the prisons uh, in order to speak to some of the Madas who are affiliated with the cartels. And in order to do so, I had to get permission, not from the warden of the prison, but from the head Mara who was incarcerated in the prison itself. So uh, what I'm curious about is how the New Deal deals with non-state actors, deals with these influences who have tre illicit transnational crime influences who have tremendous power uh, but aren't in any ways part of the formal process and in fact are not spoken of much in the process. Well, I think again it goes to both sides of the equation. That is that the, 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 the countries themselves have to have a, a broad uh, integrated sense of the rule of law and they can't be focused on we're going to develop simply the police forces and forget about the prisons. Once the convicts go into jail, that's somebody else's problem uh, because it becomes your problem very quickly, as you found out. Um, and, and I think, again, who are those people? Almost always, they're the young people. They're people who have not had any other opportunity and where they found some degree of um, inclusion, it's in a gang. And so you need to figure out a way through education and job training and opportunity to change that. That's on the one side. On the other side, I think donors have to recognize that, and this is something which um, international financial institutions particularly have been reluctant to do, that you, you can't simply focus on one element, let's say civil law, or commercial law. You have to be looking at the rule of law and you have to be looking at all of the institutions and you have to support governments who are attempting to build those institutions so that they function. And to be frank, the United States also has to think through about whether or not it continues to send back, deport um, individuals who become part of the problem in El Salvador uh, for in, in, with respect to uh, criminal activity. Um, there are lots of things that have to happen in Central America, but strengthening the institutions of the rule of law, dealing with the problems of youth unemployment are part of them. Interesting. Uh, Sarah, how should the New Deal address these, these serious issues of transnational crime, whether it's you know, cartels in Guinea-Bissau or um, cartels in Central America? I think that there's one key thing the New Deal has already done, which has put a spotlight on this, which is to argue for investment against security and justice goals with the kind of clear plan that Mark just laid out. So clearly one of the best things we can do here is start to treat these sectors as truly developmental sectors that merit the same sort of planning and the same sort of investment we would give to health or education. Mm -hmm. Because in these sorts of situations, the improvement they can deliver in welfare is actually, in many cases, greater than those sectors, particularly in the early period. 
There are some of the New Deal members that are leaders in that. So for instance, uh, Liberia has a security and justice strategy. Um, they're finding out as they go along problems that will help other countries later on. For instance, that we need to be careful not just to build new security and justice centers, but to make sure that we're paying for the salaries and maintenance of those centers as we move. Timor has, has done something similar. I think the one thing that the New Deal could advocate for, but in the end will need stronger international act action, is on the financial and the legal side. So we could take better action internationally to proactively analyze movements of finance that indicate that there are organized crime activities going on. At the moment, there was no way, for instance, to spot when the traffickers who used to go through uh, the Caribbean or Central America moved some activities to West Africa. That was not picked up until after it had happened. This is actually not that complicated a thing to do technically, but it would need an international agreement to do it. The second is uh, cooperating across jurisdictions. So uh, the court system and investigating systems in countries like the US can cooperate with other countries like Haiti, as the US has done, to try and investigate trafficking crimes. That can be a really great way, not only to put some of the people away who need to be taken out of the scene, but also to build capacity in the other systems over the same period. Excellent. Um, in uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325, they talk about inclusion, and they talk about using uh, women in, in the political process specifically. Who are, who are some of the other actors uh, that have been ignored in the past but are, are going to be critical to the success of, of the New Deal, other groups? Uh, well, you know, I think 1325 is a really important example of, of the role that women in particular play when you have a conflict situation. And, and we um, at USAID have put a lot of energy into um, supporting the inclusion of women in actually the peace negotiations as providing that key foundation and ensuring that all of our teams are very aware of the importance of including women. But you know, it's gonna be different in every country who's excluded. And what we heard a lot of this morning were a couple of the key watchwords that you need to have in mind. I, certainly, as you're moving towards a transition, and inclusion is first and foremost, whether you are the pastoralist in northeast Kenya and the road literally stops um, at, the, at the beginning of the dry lands, and Kenya is the country over there. Uh, whether it's women in, in many of these of these countries or different minority groups, um, th that it's inclusion and then and then the legitimacy and the accountability that we heard and, and fundamental to all of this is is a is a government that it, it has that state society relationship that enables people to feel included and to demand accountability and we're seeing. You know, I, I think going back to your initial bright spots question, places like Timor-Leste and Liberia where you've got the leadership that's committed to that approach models what that looks like and the resulting security and transitional progress that w is beginning to cohere. How about other stakeholders that are important and are not necessarily formally recognized in the New Deal? Say, say the role of an independent media. Do you consider those critical? And should they be addressed? Um, eh. Or social they, media. Social maybe media. is as yes. important. <laughs> well, I, I mean, in my country, uh, everyone is included, in, in fact. You know, like you have, I'm just trying to remember, you do have people that, that uh, well, at the moment, for example, let's just look at the parliamentarian uh, legislative election. We have like 21 parties. Anybody who wanted to do anything does it. And they're all included through the normal systems. Um, there was a focus to bring in women, to bring in youth, uh, but then we also have church, and it's the church, like all sorts of different religions. Mm -hmm. We have holidays for all sorts of religions. I think the, the country with most holidays is us, because we respect every, you know, like a small minority, like probably 1% or 2%, and demand the same rights as everybody else. 
So I, I, I and do you it, think that's been beneficial to the development process? Because it you? doesn't give, because when you are fragile, it's better to allow everybody in so that they don't go and mobilize. Uh, and, and if they're marginalized, <coughs> they're going to mobilize more forces. And then it's very easy to get people that are unhappy because you can't satisfy everybody. And so it's better to be just like all inclusive. It, it, it's actually better. We, we also use uh, transparency. We are very keen into transparency. Again, it's more for stability sake. Because uh, when you don't have systems in place like telecommunication, uh, television, radio out there, then rumors goes very fast, yeah? And rumors, anybody can come up with all sorts of misinformation. And, but then if you are transparent, then everything is out there in the open, automatically it just cuts down uh, the risks. I found that personally, because I, as a minister of finance, I was accused of losing money left, right, and center, and, and I couldn't understand how can you lose money when the system is so tight. Uh, and then I thought, why is this? Well, they were inventing, you know, like the opposition was trying to bring us down. And so I came up with this idea of putting the budget online. Okay, we don't have internet all over the, the country, but people accessed to it. And as soon as I did that, I finished all these accusations. For two, three years, I was able to kind of relax because they couldn't accuse me of, of, any, uh, I know, of, of all this because it was so open, it was there for everyone to see. I may have changed your topic. <laughs> yes, no, that's, uh, we love this. Uh, you, you know, there is one thing that, yeah. that Nancy just said that I think um, should be emphasized, that within uh, every society, but within every country, particularly those that are going through post-conflict reconstruction, reconciliation, you can identify those groups, whether it's Afro-Colombians, whether it's indigenous, and whether it's the North in Nigeria, that is groups and sectors that have been discriminated against in one way or the other in the past. Frequently, that's been one of the causes of conflict. So when you're thinking about how you plan for the next five years of, of sustaining a post-conflict uh, peace process, you need to be, the compact should clearly be saying, this is how we're going to change that. So at the end of that period, the metrics are showing a greater degree of inclusion of those groups within the mainstream of society. I mean, I think it goes to the heart of under, understanding what some of the causes of fragility are. And we've seen with the Arab Spring, to Amelia's point, that being exclusive of the periphery or of other groups is, in fact, a recipe to not have long-term stability. Um, and our colleague from, uh, from Yemen made a similar point this morning. It's, um, uh, USAID has put a lot of investment and energy into understanding conflict drivers. Uh, there's a reason that the Bureau is democracy, conflict, and humanitarian assistance. Um, and that has to be built in, because if you aren't able to identify those drivers of conflict, you won't be able to move past them. Something earlier about the, you said that the mental condition of the populace, and Mark, you and I were talking backstage about the, uh, the drivers, the scooter drivers in Monrovia, most of whom are former child soldiers. So I, I'm curious, uh, what happens when you have an entire society that is in some way afflicted by the conflict, that in some way has some form of post-traumatic stress disorder, and, and, and how is that a challenge, and how do you overcome it uh, in terms of instituting the New Deal and the development goals? I mean, I, I think that that is a fundamental challenge. Um, but many of the things that Amelia has said and others is that you, you have to think about at the end of this period, that group is going to see itself as much more a part of the nation than it was before. That it's gonna see some hope in terms of whether it's access to jobs or skills or its relationship with, um, with the, the society is much more positive. And so that means you have to think through, how are we going to ensure that they have access to education, better education? How are we going to see that they have access, access to job skills? How is it that we're going to ensure that they're not, in a sense, the victims of police action, but are protected by the community police that respond to their needs? So those are the kinds of questions that you want to be asking as you're looking down the road as to how you incorporate them into the society. 
Sarah, are there, are there rehabilitation things that we should be thinking about in terms of entire post-conflict societies on a macro level? I think that activities that do bring everyone in, and that means involving them in decision-making over, for instance, how an education system is designed, how government's priorities are set, and also at a local level, involve people in the kind of community councils we've seen, for instance, be one of the only resilient programs in Afghanistan over the last 10 years has been one that has had that sort of local inclusion. But I think there's another important element here of, of trust in countries where that has been destroyed by this kind of, of violence, which is that people do not see an impunity that comes across to them in all of their day-to-day -day lives of the people who were involved in perpetrating that violence on them and their families. Because if you have to go to the local police station and you still see that it's the same police officer who was involved in torturing one of your family members who is still sitting there, or you see the people who are really widely thought with good reason to have been corrupt are still sitting in positions that is not in general going to help with a process of, of healing in society. So I think there are enormous positive things we can do in development to bring people in to design processes, but the areas of justice action can also be important to give people a feeling of actual healing. I want to say something about this one also. Um, we in Timor Leste remember, well, I, I don't know if everyone knows about our uh, history, we were invaded by Indonesia. So there was a time when we couldn't even see, any, we couldn't even dress in red or white because we were traumatized. We couldn't even uh, smell the cigarette. They're famous for having this very strong uh, cigarette and we couldn't even smell that. But we went through a very strong uh, process of reconciliation. Uh, my, uh, the Prime Minister was very keen on it, and he uh, uh, said he wanted to, the violence to stop with this generation, and he's still practicing that. It's, this is very important to kind of hug the enemy and go through this process, because what we, we looked back, we said, okay, what made us do what, what happened? Because Yes, the Indonesian invaded us, and then we killed each other. But why did we kill each other? It's like, it's huge. Uh, would, you, would we have killed each other if, it didn't, if the political situation did not occur? So it goes on, and then it does have a link with the justice business. We, we still have that issue with the international community, because they think that Timor Leste is not, um, uh, that we are ignoring the rule of law, the justice uh, by the international standards. But it's more than that, because how you do, how define it? How do you, what happened in the past? Because how far do you go? Who, who should be punished? Just us uh, inside or others who made big decisions and caused the war in Timor-Leste or the invasion? So it goes on. So let's just put that aside, the conciliation process handled that. But the other trauma uh, thing, to bring the society to normalization, what we did in our government in the last five years, we, in, we invested very fast and very quick on things to, to, to channel the energy of the youth, because they were always in gangs, always throwing stones and hitting each other and in the, in using karate groups for bad things. So we had to transform all that very quickly into good things. We brought in music. We, we, we put money for sports, for uh, arts. We created, we, we made gardens, rehabilitated the gardens and the swing for little kids because they did not remember 24 years of, of um, uh, repression. Nobody was allowed to go out and play on swings. So when you want to normalize life, people are not used to this. They didn't know what a normal life is. A child doesn't know about um, swings, never saw it before. And suddenly there was this, you know, we had like children, small little kids waiting until midnight to have a, uh, 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 their chance on the swing. And I was like surprised because I, when my prime minister said, you have to do this, and I go, swings, that's not a priority. And, uh, but it worked, because the mothers at night were carrying, you know, were walking in the gardens, enjoying, and it transformed the mentality and the environment. It's very interesting. We didn't do the, 
like the debriefs. You know how you have to go to a psychologist and you talk, 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 and you cry and all that? Uh, we did it the other way around, like that. So. You did karate okay. for good things as opposed ah, to bad, yes. We even invited, uh, you know the karate famous uh, person, uh, Chang? Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan. <laughs> he came into Timor Leste. And this was a good thing because the United Nations and ourselves got together and brought him in. And then he, he went to talk to the youth and say how you use the karate for the good, not the bad. <coughs> and so it transformed. That's amazing. Uh, things. Of all the places I thought this panel was going to go, Jackie Chan was not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nancy, uh, in, in Yemen, in, uh, in Aden, they have a, uh, a slum that they call Little Mogadishu, and it's filled with thousands and thousands of Somali refugees who have who made the perilous journey uh, across the Gulf of Aden, uh, for, and then hoping to eventually move to Saudi Arabia. They're mixed in with economic migrants from uh, Ethiopia as well, and they're living in, in horrible conditions, as you can imagine. Uh, how, is, how is the New Deal Succinctly, how is the New Deal um, best positioned to help with those kind of transnational migrations and, and issues that are not just local in nature, but have become local? Well, you know, first of all, I think it underscores what a tough situation Somalia is in, that you've got all these people fleeing to Yemen. But there, but there is a long and historical relationship, and Somalis have lived in Yemen for, for, for many, you know, there's long, big webs of, of family relationships. Um, I think in terms of the migration or the refugee issues, that's less of a new deal and more of the international conventions that we have, you know, m many, most countries have been signatory towards. Um, but to the degree that there are Somalis who are a part of the fabric of the life of Yemen, I think it goes to, uh, just back to this issue of inclusion. And, and I would add that, um, in addition to addressing the trauma, and one of my wonderful mentors said that you, you, you will not be able to move forward from conflict until you let go of all hope for a better past, you know, which is a lot of what these processes help you do. Um, but, it's, but there's a, a, another side to that, and uh, for example, USAID is supporting Yemen very much in this national dialogue. Um, where it's, it's not just getting past old grievances, but having a pro an inclusive process of envisioning your future and being able to have the kind of dialogue that in repressive environments you aren't used to having. And we're seeing, you know, the versions of this that have happened in, you know, like so many things that has to be radically customized to that environment. Um, but I, it, I it, and it has to be inclusive. And so there's long, long been a presence of Somalis in Yemen, they will have to be a part of that national dialogue fundamentally. Um, we're coming close to the end of our time, but Sarah, I would, I would like you to give us a social media friendly synopsis of, of the key elements <laughs> yeah. of the New Deal for the Twitterers in the audience. You don't, you don't want to the, pass that to Mark uh, first. <laughs> uh, maybe both, maybe both. Or else the, 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 the crowd hall guys are gonna accost me at the end of the panel. So, uh, the New Deal really is about focusing on areas that in the development world we often have not understood as being so fundamental to transition. Political legitimacy, security, justice, jobs, core administrative functionality. It's about having clear expectations between government and their citizens and between government and donors so that we are both realistic about how long these processes take and that we're talking about gradual process, progress, not overnight change, but we know what results are expected and we can accompany each other in that. Was that Twitterish enough? Not um, quite. Uh, <laughs> Maybe a it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 140 characters. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark? Um, I think it is a new deal, but it, these are compacts that only work if both sides carry out their obligation. And I think that the, the key issue here is that all of us need to be clear that this is a great concept, but it will only work if both sides fulfill their part of the bargain. Excellent. Uh, well, the bell has tolled, has long tolled on our time. 
uh, here. Uh, I want to just say in closing that I think we're at a time of incredible insecurity in the world. We have vast economic challenges. We have environmental challenges. We have humanitarian challenges. Uh, and it can all be very daunting. But it is a privilege to share the stage with four individuals who believe that it's their job to address those concerns. So thank you, and thank you to the panelists. And Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. please turn your attention to the screens for a USAID video case study demonstrating the transition from fragility to prosperity.